So tonight's presentation is Flying After 50 with Dr. Jack Hastings. Uh, Jack is the chairman of our Aero Medical Council here at EAA. Um, he is, uh, we've worked together for a number of years. Uh, he's a commercial pilot with over 6,000 hours. He uh, owns and flies a Bonanza regularly. Uh, he's an EAA member, obviously. He's board certified in aerospace medicine and neurology. He's a senior AME. Uh, aviation medical examiner and this photo is kind of interesting this is uh, Jack I had to crop it down Jack but this is you riding in the back of the B-17 for which your uh, your son is the pilot correct correct of our own EAA aluminum overcast so he volunteered and my uncle <laughs> oh, yeah, really? my, that's my uncle off to the right who got yeah. me started in the link when I was 11 years old I had to uh, crop the photo down, so unfortunately, oh, okay. I'm just seeing your your headshot. But that was the or, or origin of that uh, that photo. Even though you don't all look you don't look particularly happy in the back there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you want to be the high, behind the controls, huh? Maybe so. Well, welcome aboard, Jack. It's all uh, it's all over to you now. Okay, thank you. Welcome everyone, and uh, we are talking about flying after 50. I, I would suspect that some in the audience are over 50 years of age. Uh, uh, I, for one, am over 50. I wish I were 50, as a matter of fact. So we're going to talk about some of the aspects that uh, of, of medical certification. Basically, how can we obtain uh, our medical certificate if we're just trying to fly at a later age, which applies to some of us, or can we regain or maintain our certification. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, uh, tonight. We've, we've had presentations like this at some of the forums up in Oshkosh, and this is kind of a, a reworked version uh, of that. And uh, we're going to be talking about some preventive aspects, uh, preventive medicine aspects of uh, obtaining and maintaining your certificate, which are uh, seemingly rather obvious, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, require emphasis. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, 108 years ago, of course, that the Wright brothers uh, first uh, uh, demonstrated that we could fly man-powered flight. Uh, and that's, uh, a lot has happened in the last uh, 108 years. Uh, when Alzheimer, uh, we've all heard of Alzheimer's disease, of course, when Alzheimer wrote his paper back in 1907, that was 104 years ago, only about four years after the Wright brothers, and he described a 52-year-old lady with dementia, and they called it pre-senile dementia. Although some of, it don't, some of us don't like to think of it in that way. You say, what is the definition of senility? Many of us think, well, that means if you're getting senile, you're getting forgetful and so forth. The actual definition of senile is anything below age 60. Uh, so, for example, senile cataracts simply mean or pre-senile cataracts means cataracts on developing under age 60, whereas senile cataracts, if you're 61 developed cataracts, those are called senile cataracts. So I guess we're all going to have to accept this kind of uh, unwelcome definition of senility. Uh, but one thing that's important to note, I think, uh, when Alzheimer wrote his paper in 1907, life expectancy on the planet, in the U.S., I should say, was age 50. And in our, in, since that time, uh, since the last 104 years, life expectancy has increased by over 60%, so it's now beyond age 80. And uh, we cannot uh, ignore the passage of time. Things come and go. Uh, here's an old uh, picture of the SST, the Concorde uh, that used to come to Oshkosh. Some of you remember seeing it there. Uh, at the start of this talk, I kind of wanted to see if I could capture maybe in one slide what happens as we get older. And uh, some of you may find some humor in this, some may not. But uh, uh, here's what happens uh, as, as we get older. Uh, we just, everything just starts to decline. Uh, 27% of all pilots in the U.S. Uh, looking at FAA, uh, at, age, at FAA statistics are over the age of 50. Uh, when I last talked to Gary Crump, he said that 10% of the AOPA members were over age 70. Uh, we have the flying octogenarians, and many of you are familiar with the flying octogenarians. To be eligible that, for that, you're supposed to be between the age of 80 and 90. Uh, one example of, of uh, Someone who flew for a long, long time is John Miller. 
John began flying in 1923. He actually uh, gave us a presentation in Seattle one time of watching Lindbergh take off, and he was involved in swinging the airplane around by holding the horizontal stabilizer as it was getting prepared for takeoff. He was a founding member of the Quiet Birdmen that marked a speakeasy in Greenwich Village, New York, back in, I think, December of 24, as I recall. And in December of 1998, he had completed 80 years of flying. Uh, for example, there's a DC-2 in the Smithsonian. John had 4,000 hours in that airplane, a DC-2. Here's John at uh, one of the uh, Bonanza meetings a number of years ago. John has now passed away, but he said that he maintained his uh, health by not smoking, not drinking, eating orange peels, and putting ab gas on his wounds. And that was his secret uh, to, to success, and uh, uh, he, he completed 80 years of flying. He was actually president of Flying Octogenarians at age 93, which is above the 80s. And I said, how did you do that? And he explained that they just decided to keep him on. John flew every model of the Grumman Duck. This is from Oshkosh outside the museum. I'm sure you guys recognize this. He flew, test flew every model that came off Grumman back in the, in the war days. Now let's start talking about some things that do happen to, to all of us as we get older. We can't, uh, we can't change age. We, our vision changes. You guys all know that. We have diminished visual acuity, so we have to start wearing either reading glasses or glasses for distance or bifocals for both or trifocals and so forth. Our pupils become smaller and they don't react as well, which means they don't adapt to light as well. They don't adapt to dark as well. They might do it as well, but at least not so quickly. There's decreased contrast sensitivity, so telling the difference between the cloud bank and the horizon, for example, uh, the contrast in color, subtle color changes, is more difficult as we get older. Uh, we all know that uh, lens becomes more rigid and opaque, and that leads to cataract surgery. And the old days, oh my gosh, they took the cataracts out and took the lens out, and you had to be in, have your head in sandbags and so you wouldn't move for three days and then have the big Coke bottle glasses. Now you go in for a 15-minute uh, lens replacement. So the lens becomes more rigid and sometimes has to be replaced. We can't look up as, high, as much as we'd like to. It becomes restricted from about 40 degrees down to sometimes around 20 or even 15 degrees. And you've all heard, the, uh, some of us older folks at least, uh, I'll speak for myself, can feel and hear the crunching and crackling in our neck when we look from side to side. And you try and back up the car and look over your shoulder and you say, gee, I've got to turn my whole trunk now because I can't get my head around uh, to check uh, my, my, uh, my, rear view, my rear view. We lose hearing. Uh, many of us grew up in the piston days without noise-canceling headsets, myself included. And so you lose speech discrimination. And I'm sure that some of you have had the experience where you're in the restaurant with your spouse and other people are talking, and you have a hard time picking out your wife's voice from the competing sounds of the other people talking uh, in a restaurant. Uh, my wife complains of that, for example. This is from last year at Oshkosh, this old DC-7B that was restored. Beautiful airplane. Uh, other things happen normally before, after age 50. By the time we're 80, our muscle strength actually declines by about almost a third. That's quite a change. We lose some speed. We lose some coordination. And we lose a little bit of balance. You know, you can think of some of your elderly relatives who get a little bit, uh, oh, we might use the word tottery as we get older. So these are just natural changes. Fortunately, most of our intellectual functions uh, stay pretty darn solid well into the 60s. There have been studies where experienced airline pilots have done as, in their mid-60s, retired airline pilots, of course, have done as well as 26-year-olds uh, from Embry-Riddle, for example. Uh, so intellectual functions stay stable in most people up until age, oh, about 80 or 90. But some of us, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this, will note a slowing of new learning. We may have to read over a paragraph a second time. Uh, we may have to take things a little bit slower to absorb it so our mental processing slows down. Our reactions, our speed of performance is not uh, not as good. And then you. You can read, say, I know that, you recall meeting with somebody on the street and say, I know that face, but what's his name, what's his name? And sometimes you'll wait a minute or two and say, oh, that's, that's who it is. I should have known that. And we become less mentally flexible. So sometimes 
uh, some of you, I'm sure, have grandparents who, in whom you said, well, she or he became set in their ways. They're less flexible, less able to adapt to changing situations, especially rapidly changing situations, and especially situations where there's a lot of sensory input. Big Christmas party where all the kids are over and all the grandkids, and the older person said, I get that you can see him getting nervous. They said, I can't take all this multiple sensory stimuli coming in all at once. And of course, flying is a multi-sensory task. We have to be able to take in a lot. But fortunately, uh, most of our abilities stay pretty well. I have common questions from patients saying, gee, I'm having trouble with names. Am I coming down with Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is usually not. Um, uh, we do get forgetful. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, names, not remembering names or taking a little bit of time to remember names, uh, minor memory problems like that are quite common. So uh, if we're starting to slip on a few names, I don't think we have to say, oh my gosh, I'm coming down with something here, uh, as this slide uh, illustrates here, to reminding a senior, center to, senior citizen to not forget the turn coming up. Uh, we do know, and this has been consistent for many, many years, uh, decades as a matter of fact, that, that, that less than 1% of all aircraft accidents per year are medically related. Most of those are general aviation accidents, as you know. About one quarter of those are cardiac related, and by that I mean either heart attack or stent or bypass or heart valve replacements, or in some cases nowadays even a heart transplant, although those are rare. Um, uh, cardiac and, and high blood pressure became, become the big ones, and then all the other causes, whether it's seizures or fainting or stroke or cancers and so forth, uh, all are less than, than a quarter. Uh, so it's a very small percentage of, me of accidents are medically related. Paul Pobrezny used to talk about this all the time. Here's a study that I found from uh, World War I, actually. It was in one of our medical aerospace medical journals. It was a study from World War I of 100 pilot deaths in, in military flying. Uh, over in, uh, this was in, uh, over France, I believe. Of the 100 pilot deaths, there were only two were by enemy action. Another eight were by aircraft defects, some aircraft malfunction. And the other 90 were due to a combination of three factors physical defects, which you see in blue there, carelessness and recklessness. And those are, those are in red and italics there. Because what do we know, carelessness and recklessness? We would now, in today's terms, we would call that pilot error. And many of you can often quote that 90% of, uh, or well know, I should say, that 90% of all accidents are, are due to uh, probably pilot error rather than, than a sick pilot. And um, as, as this slide illustrates, uh, what was called carelessness and recklessness back then, poor judgment, whatever, however you wanted to phrase those uh, uh, presumed um, reasons for the aircraft mishap, most of, most of it was pilot error. And that was true in World War I, and it's true in 2011 also. This is from last year at Oshkosh. Uh, Jack? Yes. Uh, you know, we're, we're five plus years into sport pilot, and I'm assuming you're not seeing any real change in the data, correct? You know, that's been monitored quite closely because uh, there were those who, uh, including some AMEs, who uh, rallied against the sport pilot rule. They wanted everyone to have a third-class medical certificate. Um, they uh, said as soon as the sport pilot comes out, we're, people are going to start falling from the skies and we're going to see a rash of accidents and they'll rapidly be rescinded by Congress. That has not happened. There have been sport pilot accidents, as you know, but that's one thing that's been very carefully followed. Since there is no medical certificate, the question has often come up, how many of the sport pilot accidents and fatalities or non-fatals that we do see are related to medical accidents? And the truth is, no greater than that in any other class of medical certificate. So our track record with sport pilot has been very, uh, very good, and I think it bears out the wisdom of uh, those who saw fit to to uh, advance the sport pilot concept. Does that answer your question, Charlie? Yes, thanks, Jack. Thank you. Um, when we, I became involved in aerospace medicine later in my career, long after I became involved in neurology, 
And uh, the aeros this field, the specialty of aerospace medicine, which has been around since 1953, actually, by the American Board of Spe Medical Specialties, it, it's right there along with cardiology and neurology and internal medicine and the rest. Because people often ask me, well, Dr. Hastings, is that a real specialty, aerospace medicine? I have to explain. Is the specialty is, in, is under the American Board of Preventive Medicine. Prevent, emphasize the word preventive. Because what we're trying to do is prevent disease and uh, trying to maintain health. And most of us in medical school, if we're going into neurology or cardiology or infectious disease or whatever we're going into, we learn how to treat disease. We learn how to treat an ulcer. We learn how to treat cancer. We learn how to treat TB. We know how to help a person recover from a stroke. We are not taught, the medical students, how to prevent stroke. Your public health is a very small part of your education because there's not enough time. If we gather anything from this uh, webinar tonight, I want to see if I can get across these concepts. Uh, in, in, in preventive medicine, we have primary, secondary, and tertiary prevent, prevention. Primary, uh, like grade one, grade two, grade three. Tertiary, be third degree prevention. Tertiary prevention is treating the disease once it occurs. So when the 45-year-old has a heart attack, he comes into the hospital and I say, you've had a heart attack, sir. I'm going to give you this medication and that medication to try and help you with your heart attack and recover from it. That is called tertiary prevention. In aviation, uh, that's equivalent to the engine seizing in flight that we haven't taken care of all those years. Then we land in a field and we had our job then becomes to get the nearest telephone and telling the insurance company where to pick up their airplane. That is what we call tertiary prevention. I, I, the engine's gone and now I have to try and save it. Secondary prevention is trying to do something before the engine ceases. In preventive medicine, we do a screening disease for before the symptom, before the prostate cancer and sore bones, we check a PSA. Women get a mammogram. Uh, the 47-year-old gets a treadmill test. The smoker gets a chest x-ray. He gets an annual physical examination. Even though they're feeling fine, you get your PSA, you get your mammogram, you get your chest x-ray if you're a smoker. That is called secondary prevention, trying to pick up the disease before it becomes out of hand. The aviation equivalent of that is doing an oil analysis. Instead of waiting for the engine to cease, let's do an oil and see if there's metal in the screen. We do other many preventive things that you guys can think of and thousands of examples, annual inspection, anything like that. Now let's go to the most important one that I want to emphasize tonight, and that's called primary prevention. In disease, that's presenting the disease in the first place. Uh, you all recall, some of us do, uh, the, the, the tobacco company's great battle about smoking does not cause lung cancer. That was a huge battle. There was a lot of vested interest in the maintenance of tobacco. There still is. But we know that if you don't smoke, your chances of lung cancer are go down about 80 to 90 percent. You know, you, you can't guarantee you won't get lung cancer if you don't smoke, but it's usually of a different kind. So primary prevention is not smoking. Watching our alcohol intake, watching our diet, physical activity is another one. To all the risk factors for stroke, including high cholesterol and diabetes and hypertension and the rest, they have now added physical inactivity. So you sitting on a couch all day is actually a risk factor, or all your life, is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease as opposed to someone who even walks a mile a day. Do we do, an, do, we do disease intervention in, in our aircraft or aviation? Sure we do. We use a hangar. We preheat. We, we, do, we, we do the engine all at, over at, at uh, TBO. We protect the interior with a sunscreen. We stay away from the coast. You know, we, we do things so that our airplane won't catch the disease. So it's the same concept. Very, very parallel concepts in aviation as we have in medicine. And if there's anything to, there was a take home message to me when I finally got into aerospace medicine, I say, gee, I never really understood the comment, this concept of primary prevention. So uh, I think that's worth uh, mentioning. Uh, when I was reviewing, uh, taking a review course for my aerospace medicine boards, it was in Washington, D.C., and they had a fellow from National Institute of Health for Health Policy and Planning, and he was a lecturer to try and help us get through our board examinations. And he made the statement that I've always remembered. He said, if we applied what we know today with no new healthcare discoveries at all, not a one, 
the beneficial public health impact would be equivalent to the discovery of sanitation. By that he meant watching our diet, watching our smoking, watching our alcohol, getting exercise, modifying hypertension if it is there, treating our diabetes if it is there, taking our walks, doing our exercises. That's what he meant by that statement. Uh, old uh, Boeing 307, huh? a few years ago at Oshkosh. We have certain things that we can do to help control our exposure to heart disease, stroke, cancer, uh, chronic lung disease, and many other conditions. We have certain risk factors that can get us in trouble, excuse me, that we cannot modify, that we have absolutely no control over. One of those is age. We cannot change our age. And older people get more illness than younger people. We know that. Sex is we can't do anything about. Uh, you take a disease, uh, uh, males have more strokes than females, for example. We can't change that. We can't change our family history. If we have a strong family history of heart disease or a strong family history of stroke uh, in re immediate relatives or siblings and so forth, we have no control over that. Uh, that's, that's in our genes. We're all made up of genetics and environment. We cannot change our genetics. So those are non-modifiable risk factors. We can't do anything about them. Um, we have others that we can't change. If we do happen to come down with diabetes, we can't undo the diabetes, but we can sure as heck treat it. We can well or not so well. We can treat hypertension if it's there. If we have heart disease, we can do bypass, we can do stents, we can do uh, valve replacements. We, can, we can't change the existence of these illnesses, but we can certainly idealize their impact on our health. If you take two diabetics uh, who have insulin-dependent diabetes at age 25, one who behaves like a champ and watches his P's and Q's like a champion can live till 85. The one who ignores the diabetes can live till maybe 45. Huge difference. So we, can, uh, we can't uh, undo these diseases, but we can treat them effectively. And there's a, I, I know I, I speak for all of us when we say, you know, we, we all, many of us know what we should do, uh, but there's a difference between we know what we should do and what we do do. Here's bringing out the B-17. Um, we do have some things we certainly do have control over. We don't have to smoke, uh, and smoking is on the decline now. Gosh, back years ago, it was in the 50% range. Now it's down somewhere around 20%, the last figures I looked at. Uh, alcohol is a major problem. It's a huge problem in airline flying e uh, even. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about uh, marijuana and illicit drugs and so forth, which are, of course, disqualifying for flying. But uh, the statistics on alcohol are really quite surprising. One in ten uh, est uh, Americans estimated to have at least uh, excess consumption of alcohol, not necessarily a disease alcoholism, but alcohol abuse maybe or excess consumption. Body weight, you've, turned, you've seen the emphasis on the uh, national news media lately about obesity and body weight and so forth, and uh, uh, the percentage of uh, young um, military eligible youngsters who cannot meet the requirements for military, uh, well, we don't have induction now, but military entrance because of body weight. We have some control over that, of course, and that's receiving increasing attention now. We can watch our diets. We don't have to eat uh, McDonald's all the time. Uh, you know, I, I switched from McDonald's to Subway to a chicken teriyaki sandwich, which was great, by the way, until I looked at the calories. And I thought, holy Moses, it was something like 920. And uh, so that uh, I had to modify my diet. Uh, we can watch our weight. We can watch our weight. We can get some exercise. And we'll point out in a little bit, it doesn't have to be a whole lot of exercise. And it does not have to be everyday exercise. We've already mentioned if we're a diabetic, we can do well with our diabetes and watch it carefully. Or we can uh, be non-compliant and ignore it. And, let the disease take us where it may, which is usually a not, a not a good ending. Staggering. Uh, one of the things I really want to talk about is blood pressure because it's so important. 
when I went to medical school back in the 60s, we were taught that the, bottom, the top number doesn't really matter. If you're 350 over 80, you're fine as long as, I'm exaggerating there, but 350 over 80 is fine as long as the 80, the bottom number, the diastolic is down there. So before 1998, the blood, what was defined as hypertension was 160 over 100. And as a matter of fact, up until they changed the FARs back in 1996, a third class Airman medical certificate could be issued if the blood pressure was no greater than 170 over 100. It was 150 over 90 for a second and first class back then. Then it was changed in 1996 to kind of an unofficial. You won't see, you won't find it in the AME guide, but it's down to 155 over 95 now. But uh, there was a review of hypertension, of the definition of it back in 1998. That's now 14 years ago. And they said, no, hypertension is really anything over 140 over 90. That's quite a drop. Just as we've seen cholesterol used to be allowable up to 300, now it's closer to 100. In 2003, there was a thing called JNC7. It was just a large consortium of uh, worldwide people who got together and talked about high blood pressure and its effect on heart disease and stroke. And they defined a for another term called prehypertension. That was defined in, uh, eight years ago now. And that is anything with a higher number, the systolic, between 120 and 139, and the diastolic, the lower number, between 80 and 89. Now just look at this slide for a minute. Look at that pre-1998, 160 over 100, and look at the, look, take the 90, 1998, 140 over 90. And so now we're saying if your blood pressure is 125 over 85, you ought to bring it down to 120 over 80. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Now, when you look at that prehypertension, the medical folks, the scientists, are not recommending necessarily treatment between 120 and 139 top number and between 80 and 89 bottom number, but they are recommending lifestyle changes. What are those? Diet, exercise, alcohol, weight control, physical activity. They're recommending those. And there's a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association that states uh, that if you do treat those risk factors, uh, you reduce your risk of heart disease and stroke. I have many a pilot, all classes including airline pilots, who, simp who are on come to me taking anti-hypertensive, taking blood pressure medication, and they get on the diet and they lose 20 pounds and they start exercising and their blood pressure goes down and they no longer need the medication. So if you have a diagnosis of hypertension and you really idealize it, can you come off medication? Many folks can. Not all, not all, but many can. Um, of all the risk factors for stroke, if you talk about smoking and exercise and diet and cholesterol and diabetes and everything else, blood pressure control is the number one risk factor for stroke. And uh, uh, I just gave you down in that bottom part there the old street advice. You know, when I would have a third class, when I was an AME in the, in the 80s, uh, my third class pilots would say, Doc, I don't want to take blood pressure medication. I'm 169 over 99. But if I start taking something, then I have to go through all this hassle with the FAA, so I'm not going to take anything. Well, he avoided getting having the hassle with the FAA, but he may have not prevented the complications of hypertension down the road stroke and, and heart disease and so forth. And now, as you guys know, hypertension can be treated by the AME and it's no longer a special issuance. Thank goodness, because that encourages pilots, I think, to be more uh, open to the idea of treating blood pressure if it starts to creep up on you. Uh, so uh, we've actually seen a decline in the risk of stroke in the population of the United States between uh, 1966 and 1996 probably largely due to the identification uh, and the treatment and the exposure to the public uh, knowledge of the risk of hypertension. There are studies that uh, dropping your blood pressure from 130 to 125 and from 85 to 80 can reduce your risk of stroke by 40 percent. So I, I just want to go back for a minute now, because many of us roam around in this range where our top numbers are 120 to 139, and our bottom numbers are 80 to 89. Uh, you know, so I guess technically, if I was 121 over 81 right this, this evening, 
I would be in that class of pre-hypertension. Uh, there are some now who are starting to look towards the number of 115, but basically many internists and cardiologists now are really advocating, whether it's by lifestyle changes alone or lifestyles and medication, to shoot for 120 over 80. And uh, uh, if I give any, if there's a single message to take home from tonight, I would say this would be it. Old Spartan Executive, they were built here in uh, Tulsa. Uh, smoking, I don't think we have to say too much about it. Uh, those, many of us have quit smoking, myself included, many years ago. Uh, but it's not only lung cancer you worry about with smoking, it's also heart disease, stroke, uh, cancer we mentioned, chronic lung disease. There are many smokers who are lucky, lucky enough to escape cancer, but gee, as they get up they can't walk to the bathroom, they have to carry an oxygen tank, they can't uh, eat because they have to stop and take breaths between bites. Uh, through an open mouth, and uh, uh, there's nothing more uncomfortable than having not being able to breathe without the use of oxygen. And so there are plenty of risks for smoking. Dr. Thor Sunt at Mayo's uh, reported it on doing 1,000 carotid artery surgery. That's the, the artery in your neck that you know some people get blocked and they have to have it cleaned out. Uh, he had 1,000 of those up at the Mayo Clinic, and there were six, I think there were eight people who were under the age of 50 when they had to have their carotids cleaned out. Uh, all of them were smokers. There was nobody under 50 who was a non-smoker. So it's a risk factor for carotid disease, for, for great vessel disease, I should say. Um, alcohol, uh, again, uh, even, if you're not, even if you're not an alcohol abuser or an alcoholic, if you're a pretty fair drinker, it increases your risk of heart disease. Uh, there's a common association with hypertension and alcohol. I have had pilots who are pretty good drinkers. I wouldn't, you know, not, not alcohol abusers. And they stop drinking for one reason or another. Sometimes the wife insists, and sometimes they've gotten in trouble. And they're on a hypertensive medication, and we're trying to get them to cut down their alcohol, and they stop the alcohol for one reason or another. And lo and behold, their blood pressure goes down, and they no longer need to take medication. Some alcohol is advisable. Cardiologists will advise a glass of red wine at night. So a couple ounces a day are okay. But uh, uh, moderation in alcohol is an important risk factor. As it, if it gets up there, then you have to worry about hypertension, stroke, and heart disease risk, which escalates with, uh, with increasing use of uh, alcohol. Uh, dietary habits, uh, well, um, you know, there's, there's so many diets out there nowadays. Uh, this is the American Heart Association, which emphasizes fat reduction to no more than 30% of calories. With saturated fat, no more than 10%. Uh, you are aware of the Pritikin diet, uh, the Atkins diet, uh, other diets out there, sugar busters, that don't emphasize fat so much as they do uh, uh, carbohydrates, because carbohydrates excess is turned into fat and so forth. I think it's beyond the scope of this discussion tonight to debate different dietary uh, uh, methods. Um, I don't think there, there is one gold standard, and I've had one thing work for one person and the next for the other, but these are good guidelines to not have too much fat, too much saturated fat. We've already talked about the alcohol portion size. Many people lose 100 pounds just by cutting down their portions. And fiber is important for colon. We know that, the, that fiber helps uh, ward off the risk of, of colon cancer. Uh, weight control, uh, as I said, it's receiving a lot of attention nowadays. Uh, maintenance of an ideal body weight. Uh, if you have a good diet it, and regular exercise, usually it's easier to maintain your ideal body weight. And if you let the dietary habits go and you let the regular exercise go, then quite often you let everything go, including body weight. And uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, weight reduction can lower the blood pressure and sometimes allow one to come off medication. Uh, and uh, uh, it certainly can reduce blood pressure. It can reduce your risk of uh, uh, heart disease and, and stroke uh, clearly. Laird to swallow. Cholesterol, uh, when I first went to medical school, they say, well, keep it below 300. Now they want your bad cholesterol below 130. And if you've had a heart attack or a stent, they want it below 100. Uh, the HDL, the good cholesterol, is good. To, should be over 35. Uh, we don't have full control over that. Sometimes that's genetically determined. 
but for example, uh, I've had a person who recently quit smoking and their, their good cholesterol went from 35 to 55 in one year. Uh, now cholesterol can be managed with dietary limitations, with medication, uh, and if you can do it that way, that is terrific. If you don't have to take any medication, that is just great if you can do it with diet and, uh, uh, and without medication. Um, Exercise, uh, I said earlier that they've actually added physical inactivity, couch potato, uh, is a risk factor for heart disease and stroke now. Uh, so exercise really is a benefit. It increases what we call our collateral circulation. Those are the detours around collapsed blood or, or blocked blood vessels. You can have collaterals in the heart that go find their, find their way, up, little detours, that find, new blood vessels that find their way around the blockage. We can do it in our legs, we can do it in our fingers. So exercise actually increases that circulation because it promotes blood flow and pumping against the blood vessels. Uh, exercise will decrease the stickiness between the little platelets we have in our blood that um, uh, are helpful for blood clotting. So it actually helps do that. If we mentioned earlier it promotes the elevation of good cholesterol. It takes down your blood pressure. It decreases stress too. Uh, many people say, I'm in a board meeting, I'm getting all heated up, and I'm on the 15th floor, and I go down, I, I say, excuse me for a minute, and I go to walk down three flights of stairs and walk back up. You know, they said, not only do I feel better, uh, I can actually focus better and kind of get rid of some of the rising anger, and it decreases my stress and allows me to continue more effectively in this contentious board meeting. An executive told me that not too long ago. Um, the kind of exercise, you don't want to do weightlifting. You're not trying to build your biceps up to Charles Atlas or anything like that. You want aerobic exercise. What do we mean by that? We mean a cardiovascular exercise, and that's simply exercise that promotes working your blood vessels and your heart. Uh, so that's called aerobic exercise. We all know our age, of course, and if you take uh, 220, that number, and you subtract your age from it, that gives you 100% maximal heart rate. So if I'm 80 years old, uh, my maximal heart rate would be 140. Uh, when you begin to exercise, you should try and achieve 60% of that maximum heart rate. Let's say uh, the person is, uh, mm, well, let's, let's say he's, a, he, let's say he's uh, 80 years old and uh, uh, his uh, minus 220, so that's 140 heart rate. Uh, you take 60% of the 140, and that's what he should try and achieve when he starts exercising, about 60% of what their 100% maximum heart rate is. Once you get used to it, then you should get closer a little bit to 80% of your maximum heart rate. Now, um, many of us, myself included, uh, when I used to ignore my diet, my exercise, and my weight, and I said, I'm going to change all this. I'm going to be a good boy now, and I'm going to start dieting and exercising, and I'm going to go full blast and lose my weight and idealize my risk factors. I used to tell myself, well, if I exercise seven days a week, that's better than five. So I did it, and I would do it for an hour a day or an hour and a half a day. What I learned was, and I've, you know, trust me, I've done it many times, uh, I, as soon as I broke that seven-day routine, then I would say, well, I skipped Sunday. I don't want to do it on Monday either. So pretty soon I would go back to nothing. The point I want to emphasize here is you don't have to go to the gym for an hour a day uh, at all. Matter of fact, if you exercise three days a week, let's say you were fit and you said, I'm only going to exercise three out of seven days, you can maintain your cardiovascular fitness. If you have a fourth day of exercise, you will gain. If you have a fifth day of exercise, you will gain further. So my point is, if you just do something for 20 to 30 minutes, even if it's walking or treadmill or bicycling or swimming or anything, and it doesn't have to be highly vigorous, something to get your heart rate up, and you do it four to five times a week, you will idealize your cardiovascular fitness. And I think you'll find if you allow yourself to take a couple of days off from exercising, you won't be so prone to when you miss your first day to chuck the program all together. Old Nordine Norseman from the patch out there. Noise, I guess uh, uh, some of us older folks have trouble with noise. I do, I know. I flew a lot with the, in, in Cessnas without any noise. I was kind of like to use one of those little tiny headsets that had no uh, earmuffs on them years ago, and I've lost some high frequency. 
Uh, and uh, so if we, some of us have lost our, some of our high frequency hearing, we can't hear our wives in the restaurant anymore, or at least pick a voice out from the others. Uh, if you haven't lost hearing, wear a noise canceling headset. If you have lost, protect what you've got left by considering a noise canceling uh, headset. How are we doing on time, Charlie? Uh, we're doing good, Jack. Are we doing okay? Yeah, I okay. want to leave about uh, 30 minutes at the end for questions. That's fine. That's fine. And if I get too, too close, just warn me, okay? Okay. Uh, I do want to mention oxygen. Um, I deal a lot with uh, aircraft accidents involving hypoxia with insurance companies and the FAA and so forth. I was involved in the paint steward business and so on. And uh, it, we kind of, you know, with our pressurized Landsayers now, or even our unpressurized triple normalized planes flying up to 25,000 feet without, uh, without uh, pressure, cabin pressurization, uh, hypoxia is becoming a significant issue. Well, I shouldn't say becoming. It always has been. But it needs some, uh, some emphasis. Um, we have to know that we're not all the same when we start out at sea level. If I'm a smoker, I've got carboxyhemoglobin in my blood already. If I, wanted, if I was worried about carbon monoxide poisoning, an emergency room calls me and said he had a 7% carboxyhemoglobin in his blood, the first question I ask is, is, is he smoking? And he said yes. And I said, well, that, that's normal for that. So uh, uh, it runs about 1% to 2% in a non-smoker. So that person who has a 10% carboxyhemoglobin, that takes away from his oxygen saturation. 10% of it's gone already. And his personal altitude, the altitude at which he'll become susceptible to hypoxia, is much lower than that than the non-smoker. Uh, we all try and uh, we, some of us have had the experience of riding in the chamber. I was in the chamber down in Oklahoma City. And the Air Force, uh, they take the, up to 25,000 feet and depressurize the cabin. Uh, or the chamber, I should say, and see, so the person can identify their symptoms of hypoxia. Uh, although I've reviewed accidents where, uh, or incidents, I should say, where military crew members in the King Air survived hypoxia. They all passed out, and the aircraft drifted down to 10,000 feet over Australia, and they all woke up. And when they were interviewed, they said, my symptoms weren't like the chamber at all. I just kind of slowly went to sleep and didn't know it. So the chamber doesn't give you you can say, now I'm safe because I could always tell. That's the trouble with hypoxia. You don't know when it's coming. And sometimes you might feel unusually good and say, everything's hunky-dory. This flight's going great. That can be your first symptom of hypoxia. One accident I reviewed a number of years ago for one of the insurance companies was a 414 coming out of Orlando that failed to pressurize. And uh, it's kind of a difficult thing to listen to, the aircraft control tapes, because you can hear the wife come on at about light flight level 210 and said, my husband passed out somewhere between 190 and 210, and, I can't, and the airplane's climbing. Uh, air traffic control and a couple of military F-16s and uh, airline pilots, everybody else tried to side up next to the climbing 414 and teach her how to disengage the autopilot so it would come down. She didn't do so, and she finally passed out herself at flight level 330. And it's amazing that she was able to stay conscious that long, and the airplane crashed and we lost both. But look at the difference in altitude. He passed out at flight level uh, as he reached about 220, and she passed out another 10,000 feet higher because he was older, he was sicker, he was on medications. His personal altitude which much, was much less than hers. Uh, back when we did the Payne Stewart accident, there was we did a bunch of airline accidents, and there was a set. It wasn't this airline, by the way. So. I'm not picking on uh, any particular airline. But there was one passenger airliner that had a failure of pressurization warning light uh, as it passed through 180. And everybody, the pilot and flight engineer, because it was the 727, and the first officer all tried to troubleshoot this light, uh, this pressurization warning light, trying changing the bulbs and so forth. Uh, the pilot and the first officer passed out. This is a true story. Uh, the flight engineer did not pass out. He had eight hours in the aircraft only as a flight engineer, and he recovered the aircraft and got it back down to, to 10,000 feet. And they all woke up and went home. Now, why did he not pass out and the rest of them did? He's the only one who put on his oxygen mask. The pilot and first officer did not. Uh, lesson learned. Uh, that's John Miller up at Oshkosh a few years ago, the fellow who did 80 years of flying, and that's uh, uh, Bruce Forbes, who's the Czech captain for United, who was saying hello to him up at Oshkosh a few years ago. Um, 
you are familiar with this being advertised now, uh, this little uh, pulse, uh, pulse oximeter. Pulse, uh, pulse oximeter. And it'll show you two things there. You see that number 98 on top? That's your oxygen saturation. We have this, we have this oxygen carrying molecule in our blood, in our right blood, red blood cells. It's called uh, hemoglobin. It carries oxygen. And if it's 100% saturated, if you can't take on anymore, you're 100% saturation. Most of us normal people, uh, I'll include myself as normal here, uh, run around 97 to 99 percent. That's the normal oxygen saturation at mean sea level. And you can see the heart rate there, the little heart shape sign. That means this person is having a pulse of 80. So that's a 98 percent saturation with a pulse of 80. That's pretty good. Uh, and then we say 100% is perfect. Most of us run around 96 to 1998. And you know, for a healthy person, about 95% is minimum. If you're undergoing surgery, the anesthesiologist will stop the operation if you drop below 90. He'll, he'll warn the surgeon. And um, now let's take a healthy Olympic marathon athlete who's running at sea level, just completed a marathon at the Olympics and won it, and take him up to 10,000 feet and just have him sit still. What's his saturation? It's about 90%. So it's because of the diminished partial pressure of oxygen. So the normal person is about 90% at 10,000 feet. What do you think that smoker is at 10,000 feet? Is he 90? No, no, he's much lower. Um, as you guys know, uh, airline passenger cabin altitudes run uh, roughly in the range of 6,000 to 8,000 feet. This may surprise you a little bit, but this appeared in one of our journals. A friend of mine, Ralph Fennell, who's now retired from American Airlines, uh, I'm sorry, United Airlines Medical Department. He just went on a few revenue flights. He got on United in Denver and parked, went around the country. And he just went up to the cockpit. This is before 9-11. It was 1995. And he just said, give me your finger, and I'm going to check your oxygen saturation. And some of the pilots were overweight, smokers, heavy, and so forth. Look, he found values as low as 80 in some of the captains and first officers who were not in shape. Now remember what I said a couple seconds ago, the anesthesiologists, they stop the operation when you hit 90. And we've had guys, airline captains flying with 80 or 82 or 86. Uh, I think, uh, again, I just wish to emphasize the importance of, uh, of this altitude. Um, we've all heard of our personal best when we're running or trying to beat the personal best in tennis or personal best or this or that. I like, I've, for a number of years, I've advocated what I call a personal altitude. All of us pilots have to learn mean sea level altitude, AGL, above ground level. We know about cabin altitudes and airliners. What I'm trying to do is, is say that each of us on this telecon have a personal altitude. I might start getting migraines at 8,000 feet. Somebody else, may can, somebody else can fly at 15,000 feet all day and not have any, any trouble. As you know, the FARs allow us to carry passengers across the country at 15,000 feet without, as, as in a private aircraft without asking, asking for oxygen or having to have, without having to provide them supplemental oxygen. Are they hypoxic? They're, they're definitely below, below 90 because they all would have been at, uh, at 90 at 10,000 feet. So I'd like to emphasize to each one of you, when you're getting up into the higher altitudes, as many of us do now, uh, uh, first of all, try and consider the factors that might lower your individual personal altitude, make you more susceptible to hypoxia, whether it's smoking or diet or exercise or weight or so forth. And uh, think about that primary prevention concept that we spoke of earlier. If you have a chance to ride in the chamber, it's quite an experience. When, when I was in the chamber and my oxygen saturation dropped to 58%, they said, are you all right? I said, yes, I'm fine. And they said, we'll talk to you on the ground. They had to tell me that once I was on the ground, because I didn't remember them saying that. Uh, old Stinson uh, Trimotor. It was a route checker for American years ago. Uh, I think I'm just about ready to wrap up. Uh, uh, this figure is a few years old, but it's still pretty much in the same ballpark. About 450,000 of us go for a medical certificate every year. That includes about 144,000 first class, maybe 80, 90,000 second class, and the rest of us 280 something uh, third class certificate. When I first started as an AME, there were something like uh, two or 3,000 special issuances per year, and for many years it hovered around 4,000. 
those were people they allowed to fly within the, with what used to call an exemption, now we call it special issuance. That number has now risen to 30,000 per year, and I think it's closer to 35,000 now. Last time I talked to Dr. Silberman. Why is that? Uh, we're not getting stricter. We're certainly getting more lenient with flying or relaxing some of our restrictions with, uh, with the advent of technology. You know, when I, back in 1975, you had a heart attack, you were down for life. Uh, uh, oh, I, that's much more than 200 now. I should, that figure's not correct. But, uh, but anyway, for an airline pilot, a disqualifying for lifetime was, was heart attack or angina. We now have over, these slides are old, probably closer to 3,000 with bypass surgery, plenty with balloon angioplasty. We've got six or eight heart transplants out there flying, some liver transplants, some lung transplants. Uh, we now have well over 600, I think, insulin-dependent diabetics flying. When I became an AME, it was diet only, otherwise you didn't fly. If you went on pills, you stopped. Now we allow most pills. We are the only country in the world certifying insulin-dependent diabetics, third class only, but the track record, just like sport pilot, has been so good that they're thinking now of advancing that to second and first class pilots. And I think we'll see that come to pass. Alcoholism, airline pilot used to be grounded for life. Back in uh, 1970, Dr. Masters, other United said, let's try and meet, rehabil rehabilitate these alcoholic airline pilots. We put a lot of money into them. They came out with the HIMSS program, Human Intervention Motor Basin Survey, 90% success rate. Many former alcoholics are now flying the airlines. We, for long, have certified monocular pilots. In Europe, they wouldn't do this for a while. Even though the Luftwaffe had monocular one-eyed aces in World War II, there was a World War I pilot with one eye who had 77 victories in World War I, actually. So once you get used to one eye, you can do pretty well. At one of our AME seminars, one of the AMEs in the audience uh, raised his question to the ophthalmologist, is that how can you be so cavalier as to certify a pilot with one eye because if he loses that eye, he's in trouble. And the ophthalmologist, uh, uh, Dr. Carlson from Virginia, thought about it for about 20 seconds and his response was, you have one heart, which uh, uh, emphasizes the importance of keeping that going too with our diet and so forth and so forth. I think that's that I'm going to stop here because I certainly want to entertain all of the questions that any of you in the audience might have. Uh, this webinar is going to be up, as Charlie said. Uh, Susan Sidlogic has been my sidekick along with Charlie for many years and trying to handle the workings of the EAA Aeromedical Council. Uh, you can reach her at, uh, at this email address or that uh, telephone number. and. Uh, We've got myself and five other council members plus 160 or 170 advisors to help with whatever your problem might be. Charlie, I think I'm going to stop there and, and see if I can uh, entertain uh, questions that, that, that people might have. Okay, Jack. Well, I appreciate it. We have over 300 people on the uh, webinar uh, tonight, so obviously a, a topic of a lot of interest for everybody. Uh, Henry wanted to know what the... I know you talked about it, but what is the upper limit for blood pressure to pass a third-class medical exam? Okay, what is the, that's a very good question because it comes up all the time. What is the upper limit of blood pressure? The, the, FAA, the FAA back in 96 tried to wrestle with this for a long time, and they said, you know what, we're, we're not going to put one in there. So if you look in the AME guide, that's the big handbook that all of us AMEs use every uh, day to certify people, you will not find any upper limit of normal. I will tell you, however, that the unofficial number above which the FAA raises its eyebrows is 155 over 95. Now think about that, 155 over 95. If you came to me as a neurologist and said, my blood pressure is 155 over 95, I feel fine, I'd say, sir, you need to treat that blood pressure. So the unofficial answer to your question is 155 over 95, although it's not set in stone, and that's far more liberal than a good primary care physician, internist, or family practice specialist would allow his patient to walk around with. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, and uh, Pete would say, what, uh, what, would like to know what's the story on red wine and its health benefits? Uh, that's been of controversy, and I, I think I'll try and answer for the cardiologist. Uh, the, the evidence for the use of red wine is stronger for 
uh, cardiovascular disease, and by that I mean coronary artery disease, heart attack, heart attack, and uh, disease of your coronary arteries that serve your heart. Um, the evidence isn't so strong for stroke, but there is evidence that says a small amount of alcohol per day, and uh, particularly red wine because of some of the ingredients uh, aside from alcohol in red wine, uh, one or two ounces a day, or one or two glasses a day, can actually, according to some scientific studies, lower your risk of, of heart, heart disease. Uh, so uh, I think that's pretty well found its way into most primary care advice when people say, ask their docs, how much can I drink? And I think they'll say one or two drinks a day, you know. And some cardiologists will say, I'd prefer red wine over one or two uh, ounces of some other alcoholic beverage. Okay, and uh, Bob has a question. Any tips for knowing when to hang it up? And are you aware of the Navy's 1,000 aviator study? Ah, uh, I, I am not. I'm not uh, I've, 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 it's been a long time since I've looked at the 1,000 aviator naval aviator study, and I. Uh, so I can't. I don't have any intimate familiarity with it. Uh, so I can't really um, speak to the to that study specifically. Um, I am aware of a retired civil aviation study in which uh, there's a high number of uh, retired airline pilots who uh, uh, find who are killed in uh, general aviation accidents after they retire from airline flying. But again, that's not due to disease; it's due to pilot error. In answer to the question, when do I know to hang it up? I think it depends. I think some of us know. Some of us can get up one morning and say, "It is time. It is time." I know that Jimmy Doolittle, for example, when he reached his 60th birthday, said, I'm not going to fly twins alone anymore. He didn't. His health was perfect. He was in cardiovascular fitness and everything else. He said, I, th I don't think I'm as sharp as I was in earlier years. I'm going to stop flying twins alone at age 60. Uh, we have a thing that's called chronological age. That's you know, the day, our birthday until now. And we have physiologic age. You know, we, you saw John Miller there earlier, who was 98, and he was pretty doggone fit. Um, I go to recurrent training with the Bonanza folks every year, and I, I know all the instructors and and uh, who teach those courses, and, and they they routinely tell me about how they just did a recurrent training in a Bonanza or a Baron on an 82-year-old, and he was sharp as a tack. Uh, but we know they also know that the incidence of Alzheimer's at age eight, between 80 and 90 can be as high as 20 percent. So here's one fellow who's okay, and here's another fellow who's not okay. So we have our chronological age, and we have our physiological age. And, and many of you, some of you have friends who are in their late 40s who say, gosh, he appears much older than his age. So he might be 49, but his physiological age may make him appear to be 59 or even 69. So I think that that's a variable answer depending upon who you are. I do think that all of us, who uh, we you know we 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 we're all victims of non-modifiable risk factors, our sex and our age. Uh, I think you have to take into account what illnesses do you have that detract from your general fitness. Is it vision? Is it hearing? Uh, not so much those two because those are both pretty easily fixable. But I, I mean diet. I mean exercise. I mean blood pressure. I mean cholesterol control. I mean. Uh, 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 alcohol control and so forth. I think those parameters of your fitness allow you to come to a self-determined, uh, get your spouse involved if you want to, uh, uh, unless your spouse doesn't like flying to begin with, but uh, uh, and we'll say I want you to stop now, but, but uh, I would do a kind of a, a self-assessment. You know, one of the highest functions we have of the brain is in our frontal lobe, and that's to be able to look into ourselves, to have some insight, some self-judgment, to know when we're doing something wrong, when, to know when we're doing something we shouldn't do, to weigh the options and to say, should I do this? Is this too much of a risk or should it not? And, and I know I'm talking to many in the audience here who have imposed personal limits on ourselves. Uh, this is myself included. I'm not going to do as much night flying. I'm not going to do as much hard IFR. I'm going to raise my personal minimums, just like I did my personal altitude. Um, 
I'm going to pay more attention to my cardiovascular risk factors. I'm going to pay attention to diet and exercise and smoking and alcohol because those I can modify, even though I may not have done so in the past, but now I've got the ones added on to the ones I can't modify, like my age. So uh, I, that may be considered by some to be a non-answer, but I think I've had pilots who really should quit flying in their late 50s because of their uh, illnesses that, they, that they're carrying around on their shoulders at the time, and I have others who are flying at age uh, 80. Uh, the FAA back in 1996 was going to put a little mental status examination for anybody over 70. They were going to put in a little quiz on memory and so on and so forth, and they decided that it was trying to put a test like that was so much over the ballpark that they, they couldn't practically apply it. So. Um, I think my, my short answer after this long answer is self-assessment and being honest with yourself, look in the mirror and say, am I fit to fly today or is there something in my background or history that makes me either want to raise my personal minimums, uh, curtail my flying in some way or when is the time to stop altogether? I think it's an individual decision for each of us. Okay, and Jesse would like you to touch a bit on sleep apnea. Yes, sleep apnea. My gosh, that's a popular topic nowadays. Uh, uh, when I graduated medical school, there, there was no such thing as sleep medicine. There was no such thing as sleep apnea. Uh, it is now of high, high interest to the FAA. Um, they, are, they are very interested in sleep apnea. As you all know, sleep apnea becomes a special issuance. If you do have sleep apnea, you have to have a sleep study to First of all, make the diagnosis of sleep apnea and see how severe it is. Then you have to have some type of compliance study. We used to use a thing called a maintenance of wakefulness test. They put you in a dark room and say, stay awake, don't fall asleep, we'll come back in an hour. Something like that. There was a thing called a multiple sleep latency test. They would ask you to stay in a dark room and we're going to give you four tries and see how quickly you fall asleep. Uh, now we have the new machines, so if you have sleep apnea, you generally are taking some type of a breathing treatment at night called CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It measures the centimeter, gives you a little puff of air to keep your passageways open, and uh, uh, they can measure the pressure somewhere between 6 or 8 or 10 or 14 centimeters of water and so forth. And now the machines they're making are downloadable, so you can take a little ship into your sleep dock and he can download it. He can say, you know, how many hours, first of all, he can, he can catch you. He can say, how many hours of sleep uh, have, you, how, how, have you gotten? How many hours of use did you have the machine on? He can also tell, uh, you know, how, if you're compliant or not. I just had a young college kid uh, from the University of Oklahoma who has a sleep apnea, and he, uh, he said, I've been 100% compliant, and uh, he, he downloaded his machine, and the... Uh, the sleep doc called me today and said I could tell that he was sitting on his bedroom table. He never even put it on. Uh, and the machine can tell that. So, but let me go back to your question about sleep apnea. Uh, of course, the, you see, what's, why the concern about sleep apnea? Well, if you're tired, if you're not getting good sleep at night, you can have excessive daytime sleepiness. You can fall asleep during the day. I don't think I have to tell of you those in the audience who don't have sleep apnea. When you're driving down the car on a country road going over Kansas at midnight, you just start to drift off in western Kansas, or you're sitting there trying to read and you read a sentence in a book, you can say, I've got to read that sentence over again, it doesn't go in, or I read the same sentence three times, that's called perseveration. I don't have to tell you guys what happens to your mental functions when you get sleepy. You tend to stare at an instrument and not do anything about it, so you kind of say, yeah, gee, that, that, that altitude is unwinding. Isn't that interesting? But you don't do anything about it. Uh, that type of thing. So it affects cognitive function and of course it makes you sleepy and when you sleep you're not alert. So the FAA now is, has a very high interest in sleep apnea. There's a lot of public interest in it. Um, we're trying to figure out a ways that we can, we're less expensive for the pilot to, to you know, establish a diagnosis and establish maintenance without recurring expensive tests. But it's a very, a very high interest for the FAA. We're having a seminar that's going to include sleep apnea in, out in Tucson in October. Uh, along with sleep apnea, we're going to talk about pilot fatigue. Although there are many people with sleep apnea out there, there are far greater numbers of pilots who don't have sleep apnea who fall asleep 
either due to boredom or a long ride or in the cockpit, who don't have sleep apnea, they just fall asleep. Uh, and uh, some of you might remember uh, an airline uh, airliner that uh, up north somewhere that passed over a city was supposed to stop at a number of months ago, uh, where where that question of the pilots being asleep came to uh, to to rest. So uh, I don't know if I've answered your question or not, but we're trying. I know the I'm working with the FAA closely. We're trying to ease the expense and the hassle of for the pilot of identifying sleep apnea and then just more importantly to have to comply with it every year saying I'm being a good boy and using my CPAP. I hope that uh, answer helps. Okay, and Bill uh, has not been flying for a couple of decades now and has developed floaters in his eyes. How does this affect being safe and legal while flying? A uh, floater, uh, how, does a, how does a floater in the eye affect flying? A floater is a non-issue. Uh, floaters are common, they are normal. What a floater is, it's a little piece of uh, carbon or hair or whatever, it looks like a little film or a little thread or part of a piece of a thread or a little nubbin or something that, uh, that's in your, between you and what you're trying to see. And the reason they call it floats, if you shift your head real quickly or shift your eyes quickly, you'll see it jiggle a little bit. It might jiggle, it might move a little bit, it might jiggle off to one side and then slowly return to the spot it is. And you can have one of those. I've had one for about 25 years in my left eye. You can have them uh, anywhere. Uh, they are normal phenomena. And those are changes that occur with normal aging that occur in the, in the what's called the vitreous, the jelly part of the eye behind the lens. They are of no consequence and they are not uh, disqualifying or concerning for medical, medical certification of any class. Okay, and uh, Dan wants to know if there's anything that can be done about quote unquote white coat syndrome as it relates to high blood pressure in the third class medical. Yeah, anything can be done about white coat syndrome. And uh, now when I, uh, uh, grew, when, I grew, when I was in medical school, and uh, I do want to say for the record here that I, John, although John Miller was there when Lindbergh took off, I was not there. But uh, uh, white coat hypertension was a term for the person who says, you know, doc, I have normal blood pressure until I go to the doctor, then it shoots up. I'm anxious, I'm worried, I might lose my medical, so it always shoots up. Some people might even say, it goes up when I go to my AME, but when I go to my regular doctor and my medical's not on the line, it doesn't go up. And that's called labile hypertension, but the term white coat hypertension came from the fact when he went to the doctor, he had his white coat on, and your blood pressure went up. Um, that's been well studied. We used to, we were taught in medical school to dismiss it, so that's nothing, that has no concerns at all. The recent literature actually says, that person who has white coat hypertension is more at risk for the, than the guy who comes into your office who doesn't have white coat hypertension. So it doesn't necessarily need treatment, but we're paying much more attention to it now than we used to. There are still those. So what I'll ask a patient of mine, if he comes into my office and he's uh, uh, one, uh, you know, 130, one, let's say 139 over 86. He says, oh, don't worry about that, Doc. I always get hypertension. I said, well, what happens at Walmart? What happens at Walgreens? What happens when you go to your regular doctor? He says, I don't go to my regular doctor. You're the only guy I see, so tell me what I should do. Uh, before I start making judgments about those few readings I get in the office, and he said, I've always been anxious going to the doctor. I hate going to doctors. I said, what I want you to do is go to Walmart, go to Walgreens, and do it, don't, don't do it in the morning after you've had, a, a, you know, eight gallons of coffee. When you're rested, you get up in the morning, you know, go out to take your wife out for pancakes or something and stop by Walmart and get your blood pressure and see what it is then. Take it maybe twice a week for a couple of weeks and then give me a call. Now, if he, call, if he was 139 over 86 in my office, he said, you know, Doc, I did that. I've done it about eight times now, and I'm 119 over 74. Then I, then I said, okay, case closed. Uh, uh, you know, before you come in next year, stop by Walmart a couple of times. So I try and instead of making any judgments about the reading that's in my office that might be aggravated by anxiety or the fact that I'm an AME, I want to get some more ammunition before I start getting worried or even worrying the pilot. I say, I want you to go into a natural setting and take it a few times yourself and give me a phone call. That's my answer to that. Okay, and uh, Brian's a 55-year-old uh, sport pilot. He says he doesn't want to be grounded forever by failing a third class for insulin-dependent diabetes. Should I be satisfied with sport? What is the pass rate for diabetics? 
Uh, the pass rate for very well controlled insulin dependent diabetes is really quite good. It's really it's very very good. Now uh, and and the matter of, and the track record has been so good as I said earlier. It's only third class pilots now, and that's within the United States because you can't fly into Canada with insulin dependent diabetes or the, or uh, I don't know about the Bahamas and Mexico, but but. They are, the track record has been so good they're thinking of extending it to first and second class certificate. They didn't do it with third class until they tried it with air traffic controllers for about 10 years at, at, and their record was so good that's when they went with pilots. But my pilots, and I have about four who are insulin dependent diabetic in my own practice, what I would say about them is these guys are so meticulous. Uh, the one I can think of right offhand is a guy who's had insulin dependent diabetes for a bunch of years. Uh, he brings in a binder, and that binder is like a PhD thesis. He has all of his hemoglobin A1Cs, all of his blood sugars, all of his letters from his doctors, all of his insulin records, and he has it all tabulated and everything else. And his ducts are so much in a row that he, I sent it down to Oklahoma City, and they say, gosh, this is, uh, all we had to do was read this, he's good to go. So if you are going to tackle, it's, it's still an uphill battle to get insulin. They look at you very, very hard. But one of the retired FAA docs said, we take a good two-hour look or hour, at least an hour look at a diabetic, uh, insulin-dependent diabetic. It's one of their more labor-intensive things because they're so careful with it. If you are going to intend to try and go from sport to third on a, on a diabetic, you say, what would cause them to flunk me where I would lose my sport pilots? That's only if you were a terribly controlled diabetic and it was evident from your record that you weren't compliant at all. Or that if you had big troubles from your diabetes, if you had bad retinal disease and the retinal hemorrhages from your diabetes, or you had a lot of heart disease, or you had a lot of kidney disease from your diabetes, or you had a lot of neuropathy with numb feet from your diabetes. If you were a pretty shaky diabetic, and, and you know, and, and had a lot of what we call end organ disease, the eyes or the kidneys or the heart or the peripheral blood vessels, then I start to weigh that pretty heavily before you take the chance of giving up sport. But if you don't have any of those end organ risk factors and you want to try it, the success rate would be pretty good. If you can are self disciplined enough that you say, I can put together that binder where those guys, I will leave no hanging chad every year when I go to submit my stuff to the FAA. By the way, uh, an insulin-dependent diabetic, all, they all know what a hemoglobin A1C is. That's kind of a 90-day blood sugar average figure. Uh, and the normal in most labs is up to about six or so. The FAA will actually allow a patient to fly up to, some, I've seen as high as nine, which is three points over normal. Now, they'll yell at you if you came in at 8.9. But they're pretty doggone liberal, just like with blood pressure they're usually more liberal than your doctor would be. Okay, and uh, Steve makes a statement that so far the FAA has resisted uh, implementing the new SSRI protocols. Will this change soon? What is the status uh, right now on that? Okay, the SSRIs have now been approved. Uh, there's only four. Now, forgive me if I don't get them all. There is, uh, and I'm going to use trade names here, Selexa is one. Um, Lexapro is another. I think Paxil is another. Uh, I'm not sure about the fourth one, but it might be Prozac. Those are the only four. Those are the only four that are allowed. Um, and this, this is just within the past year. Other countries have done it for many years, including Canada and Australia. Australia was doing it back in Bob Hoover's day, but uh, uh, back when he had his hearing. But uh, 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 they, they are approved now, but it's quite a formidable process. Uh, there's uh, the ground rules for it. I can't quote to you, uh, but uh, you know we can get them from Susan Sedlacek. But uh, basically, you have to have uh, a depression that uh, with, within certain parameters. They would uh, they don't want you to have suicide attempts and some other things. It depends on the 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 nature of the depression, how deep it was, uh, how many hospitalizations you've had, but let's say that you you allow all those hurdles. You have to have cognitive testing. You have to have what's called neuropsychological testing. Uh, that's like an all-day thing to test your memory and thinking and concentration, your personality and so forth, test for depression. 
You've got to have that before you would be certified. And then every year you have to have that cognitive testing again. Uh, the policy has just come about, and uh, uh, I know of a, a fellow, a friend of mine in the aerospace medicine department up at Mayo, who just has his first case that he's submitting now. Uh, my acquaintance is not great with it because the psychiatrists are involved in that, not me as a neurologist, but they're just starting it now. Uh, when I looked at the ground rules for having to be certified on an SSRI, uh, not only the initial ones, but the follow-up ones, they're quite, quite formidable. And I, I, you know, it just uh, when I looked at them, I said, "My gosh, that's going to be beyond the range of uh, affordability for for most pilots." So it's a pretty, it's an open door, but it's only. Comment that it's only open. You there, Charlie? Yeah, you were just cutting Charlie? out a little. Yeah, I'm here. I, you just cut out for a second. Could you repeat your answer? Oh, oh, oh! you missed my whole answer? Not the entire part. About the open door. Oh, the open door, yeah. I would say the door is open to SSRIs. No, I don't know if there's been a few certified. There probably have by now. Uh, but it's not a very wide crack, not, not a, a wide open door. It's only open not more than an inch or two, I would say. Okay, but I guess it is the nose under the tent at least, huh? It's the nose under the tent, and I think we'll see modification of that. And I think the modification we're going to see to the SSRIs, where it's not so such a high mountain to climb to maintain certification, I think when we get a little experience under the belt, you'll we'll see that relaxed. I, I, I think it's a, an important door to be opened. Okay. Uh, Mark would like to know if there's any evidence that piloting helps preserve your phys physiological age. Um, particularly regarding mental capacity? I would say that does piloting help your physiological age? I think it does. I think there's some research science, uh, science behind that, not specifically to piloting, but including piloting. Because, and by that I mean anything that keeps your mind active. There is some science out there that uses some fancy techniques with imaging studies and some chemical studies we can do on the brain to say that if you're actually engaged in mental activity, whether it's work or reading or some activity, whether whatever it is, piloting would certainly be included in that. Something that tasks your mental capacities and wants you to do something rather than watching TV all day, that you can actually show that the little things called dendrites, those are the little connectors, little nerve fibers, connectors between the brain cells, that they actually promote the branching of those even in your 70s and 80s and 90s. So uh, they say that what they call, the common late term for that is called mental reserve. Can I build up my mental reserves to help ward off Alzheimer's, for example? There's some scientific evidence to say that as long as you're engaged mentally, and that would include piloting, that you are continuing to branch these little dendrites in your brain cells, and it is building up your cognitive reserve, and there's some scientific evidence to say that that can indeed help um, uh, raise your threshold for, for cognitive changes. Yes, so I think I think uh, a qualified yes to that answer. Okay, a couple of questions relating to vision. Uh, specifically, is night vision impacted with age, and is there any way to sustain it? And could you just recap a little bit your earlier comments on vision? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, you, you cannot train your night vision. Um, uh, when we have daytime vision with light, we're using mostly uh, our, our what we call our, um, our cones in our central vision. Uh, and our peripheral vision is dimmer and darker, and those are called the rods. And, and when we, uh, if you turn off the lights in your room right now, as you all know, it takes a while for your eyes to adjust to the darkness, and then you can see your bookshelf across from your desk there. Well, when you first turned off the light, you couldn't. That's because your eyes are adapting uh, to that night, and your eyes have to adapt when, when dusk comes on, too. If you're flying into the sunset, of course, there's plenty of time to do that. Uh, but the retina is very sensitive to lack of oxygen. It's just about as sensitive as the brain, and we call the retina, the lining of the eye, the window to the brain. 
And people who faint, for example, they'll sometimes say, my vision turned yellow, or it got dark as if night was approaching, or it was like dust, or turning down a rheostat. That is not the brain being starved of blood. That's the retina, the lining of the eye. And we can tell a fainter that way sometimes. They'll say, my vision turned yellow, and I got my head down, and I was OK. So, but you cannot train yourself to that, no. Uh, your, uh, your vision becomes uh, sensitive uh, at, at uh, night, uh, lack, and it becomes more sensitive to hypoxia also. So example, for example, the military requires you to use oxygen from the ground up at night for that reason. They say, we don't want your, your night vision to be compromised, uh, as it is in all of us, by you know, by, by our night vision is as good as our day vision. We don't want it further compromised if you're flying even at a cabin altitude of six or 8,000 feet. So they require ground up oxygen at night. But the answer to your question is you cannot train yourself to get rid of, to for a refraction error, you'll find exercises in the pilot magazine saying you can exercise your eyes out of this or that. You cannot train your eyes to night vision. Um, you can help with oxygen at night. Um, we talked about some of the what happens normally with all of us. Our vision, our contrast sensitivity decreases. Uh, I don't have to tell any of you in the audience that it's it's uh, it's uh, your contrast isn't as good at night. So if you got your headlights on, you can't see you know the the boundary between the curb and the uh, the pavement as well as you could. If you're on a highway that just has that white stripe along the edge that's in the dim periphery of your headlights there, and you say, am I crossing that white line going into the median or not? Some of you have had the experience where that's less, it's not as sharp as it used to be, the contrast between the white line and the, and the blacktop at night. So you lose contrast sensitivity. And that's why you'll find people, older, your, some of your, your elderly relatives saying, I don't drive at night anymore because of that. Um, uh, no, there isn't any way to... Uh, to train that, you know, now it's aggravated by things that can be fixed. If you've got decreasing night vision because of age and so forth, and you're, uh, then, then if you've got cataracts, then it kind of tips the balance, and your night vision will show up earlier because of the further impairment by the cataracts. So we can fix the fixable things, but we cannot uh, train uh, or bolster our defenses against night vision, no. Okay, Jack. Uh, several people have asked this, so I'm going to make a composite question for you. You were with us all along when we pushed uh, for the sport pilot rule that got us a driver's license medical uh, for anyone that wanted to fly as a sport pilot. So a lot of people are asking, what is the future of the third class medical? So time to get your crystal ball out and give us your thoughts okay. on that. Okay, uh, this is that's an interesting question. Will we see the disappearance of the third class medical as advocated by uh, by some, uh, including some pilot organizations that I'm aware of, and uh, uh, many people about that? It's an interesting question. I think a very valid one. You know, uh, the former federal air surgeon John Jordan uh, actually would at our AME seminars would talk about that, and uh, we would actually have debates on. What would be the impact of abolishing the third class medical and aviation safety? And I don't think there's a real clear answer to that. Um, uh, you know, you saw earlier on the slide we said less than one tenth of one percent of all less than one percent of all accidents are medically related. And again, I'll quote our former federal air surgeon John Jordan, who said that means one of two things, Jack. He said, either one, either we're doing a hell of a job, or we're not as important as we think we are. One of the two. Uh, and uh, in other words, if we didn't have a third class medical, we'd still have 90% pilot errors. So are we really wasting our time doing medicals at all? And I think that was openly debated. Now, when I've talked, we talked about that debate, and uh, Fred Tilton, the current federal air surgeon, has been asked that at, at, the, at our meetings up there at Oshkosh and at the Ask the Administrator sessions up in the FAA building up there at Oshkosh. He said, I know that he personally says, I don't think it's going to happen during his tenure. Not that he is personally against it. Well, the answer that he gave me, and the answer I've heard him give the pilot audience at Oshkosh in the FAA building was, he said, I think the very fact that we have a third class medical at all deters a lot of pilots from even trying to fly who otherwise would be out there flying 
And those are pilots who you, and he points at me, and by that I mean all the pilots in this audience, you guys wouldn't want that pilot up there with you either. So that was kind of his rationale for saying, I like the existence of the third class medical. But let me take that one step further. Uh, you know, we have, if we don't get rid of, the, if we get rid of the third class medical, then he would say, well, there might be some people out there who are flying third class that we really don't think, should, that all of us on this audience would be uncomfortable flying with. And I, I can see that point. I can see that point. But if that is the point, and let's say we retain the third class medical, look at all the conditions that we now certify. There were absolute disqualifications back in 1976. There's some 39 conditions now that don't even have to go in, they're called AASI, AME Assisted Special Issuance, where the FAA will grant the AME the authority to watch this guy for six years with his thyroid or his heart or his atrial fibrillation or this or that or the other thing. So we've relaxed the rules very much and we have many more people are flying who couldn't fly before. I still think we have a long way to go. My personal view is, and I'm not speaking as an FAA spokesman now, but just as an AME of many years and a pilot, I, I think there are an awful lot of things we do that, uh, that, that could, uh, aren't necessary for aviation safety. At one of our meetings, the former uh, air safety administrator over, John, uh, over uh, Fred Tilton was Nick Sabatini from Washington. At one of our forums, I said, uh, Mr. Sabatini, uh, if we had $10 to spend on aviation safety for the entire year, are we better off spending $5 of that? Uh, are we better off spending that $10 on uh, checking thyroids and hearts and prostates and things like that? Or are we better off spending that on teaching the healthy young pilot with no disease to not use poor judgment. And of course, what I was getting at was pilot error. He thought for a minute, and then he said, you're Hastings, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, uh, he said my answer is, those are not mutually ex exclusive. So <laughs> it was kind of a not answer. He said, you know, we don't have to uh, ignore medical. So I, what I would hope to see there, if not the abolition of the third class, you say, would I have any personal sympathy for it? I can see Fred Tilton's argument. I certainly think there's an awful lot that we do, even in special issuance, that probably could be relaxed without compromised aviation safety. Uh, and I think we've already seen evidence of that in sport pilots. So, uh, uh, you know, the sport pilot took many, many years to, to happen. I do think we'll see some progressive relaxation of rules. I, I, I don't get a sense that we're going to see the third class uh, medical go in the near future, though. Okay. Well, Jack, I really appreciate you taking time tonight for this uh, presentation. We've uh, already gone over uh, our time limit, so we're going to call an end to this. But I want to thank you for your time tonight and for all of the work that you do year-round as a volunteer for EAA as chairman of the Aero Medical Council and helping individual members regain their medicals. I know, uh, I know you've uh, had some heartfelt thanks from a number of people you've helped through the system and uh, there's probably nothing more rewarding than getting somebody their ability to fly back after losing it I would think. Well thank you Charlie, I, 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 I enjoy doing this stuff, I, I know what it's like, uh, I can only imagine what it would be like to have your medical pulled and, and if, uh, I, I hate to have to say that ever. Okay. Well, thanks, Jack. Thanks for everybody tuning in. We had a great turnout tonight, over 300 people joining us for this topic. Uh, again, Jack, could you back up one slide? If you there have you any questions at EAA, give us a call. Uh, the number's on the screen, 920-426-6112, Susan Sedlacek, uh, or send us an email at info at EAA.org. Uh, this webinar will be posted by tomorrow evening at www.eaa.org slash webinars. And thanks for tuning in, and good night.